uh, Natchez, Mississippi, the jewel of the Mississippi River. That's what people like to call this beautiful southern city. And it really is the epitome of the antebellum south. And one of the reasons why is because it is full of antebellum mansions. All of these survived the Civil War and have stayed around for quite a long time. Although two of them that I'm going to feature in this video need a lot of love. All of the mansions that you're going to be seeing in this video reputedly are haunted. Our first stop is going to be the Arlington Mansion. One of the pioneers of Natchez, Mississippi was Pierre Surgette. He was born in France in 1731 and he had a large family, 11 children, and he moved all of them from Louisiana to Mississippi. Three of them were prominent landowners in Natchez and one of them was his daughter, Jane Surgette White. In 1816, construction began on her home which today is known as Arlington. It's federal style, and it was considered a villa at the time. She was very excited about this home, but she died after spending only one night in the home. Her sister inherited it, along with all of the furnishings, and five generations of the Surgate family lived at Arlington. And those furnishings stayed with it for a long time, too. In 1977, there was a 300-year-old spinet piano that was still in the home. It was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1974, but nobody took care of it, and it quickly deteriorated. By the 1990s, it was pretty much a wreck, and then in 2001, a devastating fire destroyed the rear gallery. The fire went up and also consumed the attic, and there was just a lot of damage to the home. Home. The historic Natchez Foundation did install a new roof and rafters, but the house is still a wreck, as you can see, and it's had a lot of people that have vandalized it and just not taken care of it. The ghost story that's connected to this involves members of the surrogate family. People have said that every night at the stroke of midnight, a ghostly carriage drives up the long drive and pulls up to the main entrance of Arlington. The door opens and a beautiful woman climbs out, walks up the steps, and passes through the unopened front door. Could this actually be Jane coming back to her home in the afterlife? She didn't get to really enjoy it in her life. Next, we're going to look at Stanton Hall. Frederick Stanton, for whom this is named, was born near Belfast, Ireland in 1794, and he immigrated to America when he was 21. He moved to Natchez, and he met his wife, Hulda, there, and they got married in 1827. He put his fortunes into cotton, and he made a lot of money with it. He purchased a plot of land in 1849 to build Stanton Hall. He hired architect Captain Thomas Rose, and Thomas Rose then hired a bunch of local artisans to help him with the building. The mansion was completed in 1858 and originally was called Belfast. Past. Stanton moved in with his family and they planted a bunch of oak trees and a lot of those you can still see outside of the home today. The house is made of clay bricks that were burned on the premises. They were covered over with stucco and then painted this white that you see everywhere. The front doors were flanked with four huge white Corinthian columns and then the entryway leads into an arched hall 72 feet long. Inside the doorknobs are made of Sheffield silver as were the lock plates, hinges and call bells. The inside was decorated as Greek Revival and Italianate in styles. There's gold mirrors and bronze chandeliers, and those mirrors were made in France. The fireplace mantles were carved from the finest white Carrera marble, and the mantles were sculpted in New York. Stanton, unfortunately, didn't get to live here for very long. He died a month after the home was completed in 1858. This seems to be a running theme we're going to have here. During the siege of Vicksburg, the Stanton home was slightly damaged by a gunboat's cannonball. The family eventually had to leave, and between 1894 and 1901, Belfast housed Stanton College for young ladies. And that's when it took on its name of Stanton Hall. There have been some private owners, and then it was also made into a bed and breakfast. And today, you can tour the house if you choose to do so. We do have some hauntings here. The first involves Mrs. Vera Damewood, who's a retired associate manager of the Mississippi Tourism Department. She and another woman were going to stay overnight here at Stanton Hall. The housekeeper told them to let her know when they wanted to come in, she would turn the alarm off, and then once they got there, she was going to reset the alarm. So she did that, and then she told them that they needed to be out of the mansion by 9 a.m. before the tours began. So the next morning, Mrs. Dame Wood was lying in bed when she heard a man's deep voice say, good morning. She sat up, she looked around, sees no one in the room, so she fell back to sleep. A few minutes later, she again heard the deep voice. Still groggy, she looked over at the alarm clock, and it was about 6 a.m. She assumed that she had heard the voice of the yardman. At 7 a.m., Mrs. Damon woke up the other woman who was there with her. They went down to have breakfast. The housekeeper was working in the kitchen, and she asked Mrs. Damewood, hey, how did you sleep? 
She said that she'd slept fine, but the yardman had woken her up a couple of times. The housekeeper gets this puzzled look on her face, and then she says, there are no yardmen here at Stanton Hall. They had done all their work the day before, so there was none of them there that day, and they weren't supposed to be there that day. Then she told Mrs. Damewood that she should feel privileged because Colonel Stanton's ghost does not talk to everybody. So apparently the man who built the home was saying, good morning. There have also been stories about the ghost rattling doorknobs to wake people up. And the housekeeper says that she sometimes hears the patter of little feet in the hallway, most likely the footsteps of the ghosts of the Stanton's children. The alarm system goes off at least once a month for no particular reason. And there's nobody living in the home, so they're not sure why. Electricians have found nothing wrong with the wire. The most common reported ghost here at Stanton Hall is connected to the youngest members of the family who've owned the house. In the 1870s and 1880s, the Stanton family owned a black cocker spaniel. Frederick and Holda's children and grandchildren were so fond of this little dog that it was treated like a member of the family. And apparently the dog loved being here so much that it never really left even after it died. Tour guides will tell you people touring the house tell us that they've seen a little black cocker spaniel inside the house. We laugh about the little ghost. We blame him if we hear creaks or squeaks. Of course, you hear creaks and squeaks all the time in old houses, so the dog's ghost might not be responsible. So is this haunted by a little dog and the colonel? Next, we have Longwood Mansion, and this is a gorgeous building from the outside. It's very unique. It is the most unique mansion in the city by far. But when you go inside, you see there's something terribly wrong with this home. It was never finished. The home originally belonged to Holler Nutt. He was a wealthy businessman and planter, scientist, and an inventor. Dr. Nutt hired architect Samuel Sloan to design the home in 1859. He wanted it to be oriental style, octagonal in shape, and he wanted it topped by a Byzantine Moorish dome. Construction began in 1860, but unfortunately, the Civil War started up and work was halted in 1861 because all of the workers needed to go join militias. Those workmen dropped their tools and left their scaffoldings inside the home, and it's still as they left it today. Only the exterior was finished. This house rises to six stories and there are 30,000 square feet inside that need to be completed. Dr. Nutt didn't really believe that the Civil War was going to happen. He'd spent about $100,000 on the mansion and so he did not have enough money to finish what he had started. What he was able to do is to take nine rooms on the first floor and make them habitable. He installed windows, doors, woodwork, cypress floors, and he moved the family in in 1862. And that's all that was ever finished of this home were those nine rooms. Unfortunately, he died of pneumonia in 1864 at the age of 48. And he was a broken man because even though he was a Southerner, he was a sympathizer of the Union. But they still burned all of his stuff. And so he lost everything. His wife and their eight children continued to live on the first floor of Longwood. The last descendants of the Nutt family to live here at Longwood were the five children of Lily Nutt, and eventually the house then just became abandoned. The home is registered as a National Historic Landmark. That happened in 1971, and a lot of people call it Nutt's Folly. It is the largest octagonal house in the United States. The ghost stories connected to this involve people seeing the ghost of Holler Nut pacing inside the house and wandering through the grounds. An elderly handyman was told to go inside Longwood and clean up the leaves and the debris that had collected on the upper floors. In just a few minutes, he came running back outside. He was clearly shaken. He grabbed his tools and he said, I am not going back into that home or to those upper floors. And he wouldn't tell people much about what he had seen other than there was a man in old clothes talking to himself up there. In the 1980s, a grandson of Mrs. Lewis Burns, the resident hostess at Longwood, was standing inside her room when he glanced over one of the chairs and was surprised to see a woman in a pink hoop skirt standing on the stairs. Some people wonder if this is Holler's wife, Julia, who was standing there. A tour guide there claims that the lights blink off and on on their own. And then after she'd been working there for a few weeks, she opened up the house in the morning. She discovered that somebody had been messing around during the night. I can't tell you how many times I've had to straighten up the portraits of Holler's mother and father in the master bedroom. When we come back to the house in the morning, they'll be crooked or turned sideways. The children's room is another active location inside the house. Sometimes in the morning, the little children's furniture is scattered all over the place as if somebody's been playing with it. So they're guessing that they have some ghost kids who do play with it. Longwood has a state-of-the-art alarm system and sprinkler system. So it's probably not likely that somebody's breaking in and messing with all this stuff. And if you recognize this home and you're a fan of HBO series True Blood, it's because it was selected as the home of Russell Edgington, who was the vampire king of Mississippi in the third season. This is Monmouth Mansion. John Hankinson was a postmaster, and he built this federal-style mansion in 1818. 
He named the house after the place of his birth, which was Monmouth County in New Jersey. He lived here with his wife, Frances, and their six children until 1823, when financial setbacks forced him to mortgage the main house. He defaulted on the loan, and so the estate was sold at auction. The next owner was John Anthony Quitman. He came from New York. He was born there in 1799. He was a lawyer who became president of a railroad and a bank and the director of a steamboat company. The inside features mantelpieces that are made from white and beige veined black marble. The front of the house is Greek revival in style. It was a change that Quitman did make himself. The outside brick has been covered over with stucco as well. And at one point, Jefferson Davis was even a guest here at Monmouth. During the Civil War, the slaves who were housed here and worked here fled, and Union officers came in and took up residence inside the home. While they were there, Quitman's daughters and their families had to live upstairs. Members of the Quitman family have lived here until 1919. In 1922, a widow named Annie Gwynn took possession of the home, and they transformed Monmouth into a dairy farm. The plantation was put up for sale in 1960, but nobody would buy it. It started to deteriorate really badly until a family by the name of Riches came in in 1978 and they restored it. Today, it is operated as a beautiful bed and breakfast, and it's a popular venue for weddings. It's also appeared in a lot of movies. The main ghost at this mansion is John Quitman himself. He was first seen in the 1970 when the Riches began restoring the old house. Workers reported feeling as though they were being watched by what they described as a strong presence. When the Riches moved their family into the home, their daughters, who were little girls at the time, said that they were sleeping in room 23. They heard someone stomping up the stairs. They told their parents that it sounded like someone wearing boots with leather soles was walking up wooden stairs. That was a little weird because the entire house, including the stairs, were carpeted. So how they were making a wooden sound? Nobody knows. Over the next few years, everyone in the Riches family heard the stomping coming up the stairs. Staff, workmen, and even police claimed to have heard someone clomping around the house at all hours. The girls also saw a man walk through the rooms and vanish into the opposite wall on several occasions. And a guest staying in room 30 saw a man wearing a blue military uniform walk towards their bed. The ghost looked around the room and then just disappeared. In 1989, a man and his wife saw a male ghost from a later era. They said they were walking on the sidewalk at the rear of the main house in the direction of the gift shop when they saw a man wearing a Confederate uniform walk out of the Rose Garden and head across the courtyard. The closer he got to the buildings, the more transparent he became. He had not taken more than 50 steps before he completely disappeared. There's also some unidentified entities that have made their presence known here. One of the gardeners said that on nights when he worked late, he would be walking inside Monmouth and he would hear weird noises coming from the attic. One of the ladies who works in the gift shop said that one afternoon, a lady who had taken a walk around the gardens in the back returned to the gift shop looking very distressed. Wiping a tear from her eye, she said that she saw a lady and a child crying by the pond. The woman who said she was a medium sensed that the lady and the child were crying because a baby had just died. The lady in the gift shop informed the woman that Mrs. Quitman had 11 children, only six of whom grew to adulthood. So the guest quite possibly saw Mrs. Quitman and one of the children weeping over a child that she had lost. Several years ago, the office manager was leaving the main house one night. She turned on the burglar alarm and noticed that the message, Disturbance in Zone 4, came up. She walked into the parlor and was startled by the sight of the prisms hanging from a lamp swinging back and forth. She was dumbstruck at first. Then a few seconds later, she realized that she was in the presence of something very weird. She stopped the prisms from moving and went back to the other room. She turned off the alarm and returned to the parlor. Once again, the prisms were moving on their own. After she stopped them again, she looked up towards the ceiling and announced, That will be enough of that. I don't want to have to come back in here. The office manager continued talking to the mischievous spirit all the way back through the house. And then finally we have Linden Mansion. Part of this home was built all the way back in 1790. The east wing was added in 1818 and further additions were made in 1829 and 1850. One of the earliest owners of Linden was Senator Thomas Reed. In 1849, it was purchased by William and Jane Connor. And today, Linden is owned by Jeanette Feltus. Her family is the sixth generation to live in the old house. It is a very popular bed and breakfast, and the front door might be familiar to some of you who are fans of the movie Gone with the Wind, because this front door was copied for the front door of Tara in the movie Gone with the Wind. Jeanette Feltus, who now owns the home, has a few ghost stories to tell. She said one afternoon around the turn of the century, family members were sitting on the back gallery. Suddenly they heard the crunching sound of the wheels of a buggy on the gravel road that winds around Linden. They recognized the sound of the wheels, but they were bewildered because they realized that the owner of the buggy had died a few days before. A male member of the family ran to the front of the house. Within a few minutes, he reported back to the others, 
but no one was there. Jeanette's husband had been at this house when he was a young boy. His name is Richard. One afternoon, he and several of his friends were playing pool upstairs. He was trying to take a shot when one of the boys ran into the room and told the others to look out the window. Richard was stunned by what he saw. A woman jumped off the roof and floated across the courtyard. Then she disappeared before she landed on the ground. That is very weird. Her father-in-law, Dick Feltis, also had lived here at Linden. He was sleeping in the bedroom on the first floor when he was awakened by the feeling that he was being watched. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he was amazed to see his cousin, who had died a few days before, standing at the foot of his bed. He asked his cousin how he was doing and replied that he was fine, that he'd just come back to see how everyone else was doing. He reached out to shake his cousin's hand, but the ghost shook his head and then vanished. Now, Dick died in the 1970s, and he apparently became a ghost here as well. When he was elderly, he had several strokes, and he had to walk with a cane. He loved milk punch, but he could no longer drink it out of a cup, so he had to put it in a Pepsi Cola bottle so that he could drink it. He had a little refrigerator in his bedroom where he'd keep it. Some nights when Dick couldn't sleep, you could hear him in the middle of the night going peck, peck, peck with his cane out on the gallery. He'd sit down in one of the chairs and have a drink or two of his milk. Then he'd go peck, peck, peck back to his room. Every now and then, guests staying in Dick's room hear the tapping of his cane out on the gallery. Three couples who had rented rooms in the gallery, where Dick had spent so many sleepless nights, reported hearing somebody walking around all night with a cane. And it turns out that the day they heard that was Dick's birthday. Jeanette reported that in 2005, she had a couple who were staying here at Linden, and they encountered other ghosts. They were staying in Margaret's room on the second floor of the main house. The couple had come with their daughter, apparently, and she was very talented. She had a beautiful voice and played piano. The father woke up in the middle of the night because he heard somebody singing, so he woke up his wife and said, What is Carolyn doing? Singing in her sleep? His wife said, That's not Carolyn singing. They both heard somebody singing in the house. They don't know who it was because neither the Connors nor the Feltises could carry a tune in a bucket. So who was singing? There's been the ghost of a man wearing a top hat that's been seen but not identified. This has appeared in bedrooms upstairs on several occasions and each of those rooms had two beds so when people were staying there and had company they would have a bed for their company to stay in a lot of the girls came down the next morning they say to Jeanette Mrs. Feltis you know how you feel when somebody's staring at you I woke up and there was a man standing by my bed with a top hat on Jeanette would say to them oh that's cousin John he lives in the attic when I just moved in the house I could hear him stomping in the attic he's sort of quieted down right now I guess he's gotten used to me anyway I always told cousin John if he'd just stay up in the attic I'd stay down here I had a guest once who offered to hold a seance and send him to heaven. I said I didn't want to do that because he keeps me safe. A woman was staying in 2010 and she was in Dick's room and she said that the door opened several times all by itself. She was a little unnerved, but she decided I'm going to go to bed. So she shuts out the light, goes and lays down. Then just past midnight, she heard the heavy footsteps of someone walking through the room. After about a minute, the walking stopped. Then she heard a deep male voice whisper in her ear, I'm sorry, I bothered you. She figures it was probably Dick's ghost. So these are just some of the beautiful mansions that you can see in Natchez. There are so many of them. I encourage you to check out the city. I did an earlier video of the cemetery. It's just gorgeous. Wonderful place to visit. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for your support. You take care now. Bye-bye.